Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Josh Phillips. I'm a professor at Penn State University Brandywine. This is a lecture for my students in uh, fall 2020 semester. This is on the US Constitution. I am posting this on YouTube because I need a little bit more space and uh, as far as memory space and YouTube allows for a lot more of that uh, with the video as opposed to my on campus platform uh, that happens online. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of uh, context for uh, who this is for. And obviously, if you're not in my class, you're welcome to follow along and I'd welcome your comments. So today's lesson is on the U.S. Constitution. We're going to do a little bit of the history of the U.S. Constitution. And then specifically, we're going to focus in on the First Amendment. For those of you who are in my class, I have posted on your Canvas page a link to this. I recommend you watch it first. It's about six minutes long. It's, uh, I believe it's from PBS but it's freedom of speech, crash course, government and politics. Um, you can search it on YouTube if you're not in my class. If you are in my class, I'll send you a link. Watch that and that'll give us a little bit of background on the First Amendment. So let's talk about the Constitution before we get specifically into the First Amendment. The Constitution, we need to kind of go, we need to go back to 1776, which is when the Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson. This guy right here. 1776, Thomas Jefferson writes a Declaration of Independence. America says it's going to be its own country. And then we need to form a government. The first government we form is under what are known as the Articles of Confederation. These Articles of Confederation loosely hold together the 13 colonies that are existing in what we now call the United States of America. For a metaphor to figure out what this kind of looked like. This isn't an exact government representation, but it'll help give us, an, give us an idea in 2020. Imagine the European Union today. Separate countries that are all hold that 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 hold themselves together under this European Union flag, but they're all separate. This is what the Articles of Confederation were about. Each individual state within the initial United States of America. Each individual state sort of acted as its own sovereign uh, nation. Um, they all had their own currency. They all, uh, many of them had their own military. Uh, they all wanted to sort of be independent from each other without any influence um, or overbearingness from a centralized government. But they wanted to hold themselves together in case things like war came up. They wanted to be able to co cooperate with their neighbors. Right, the same way that France and Spain want to be able to co cooperate now under the European Union, places like uh, you know, Virginia and Maryland wanted to be able to cooperate together in 1776 when we put together the Articles of Confederation. This went on for about 10 years. The Articles of Confederation, it was soon found out that they had a lot of holes in it. It didn't hold the country together as tightly as it needed to. Again, there was different currencies, there was uh, different military powers in each separate state. And so we got a little worried that there wasn't a strong enough central government. So in 1786, the uh, Continental, well, the beginnings of the Continental Congress began to kind of come together. And their initial reaction wasn't to create a U.S. Constitution. Their initial reaction was, let's just fix the Articles of Confederation. This goes on for about a year. It doesn't work out. So in 1787, they said, okay, we need to scrap the Articles of Confederation. We need to create a new constitution that's going to hold the 13 colonies together. So we create the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution primary author was James Madison, who would go on to become a president. And what is of interest for the U.S. Constitution, this is what I'm going to stress throughout multiple slides in this in this PowerPoint here, is that it is, it is a document written by the people to the government, which is drastically different than many other sort of so-called, what we can call them constitutions or legal documents throughout the history of the world. Usually these sort of legal documents that hold a country together do so as in, in the following manner. They say, I, the king, am in charge and I'm gonna tell you all how to behave. It's not what the US Constitution does. The US Constitution starts off with, we, the people, are going to write a letter to the government and tell the government how it can behave and act towards us. How, you know, what are we going to allow the US government to do to us, the people, right? It's not the reverse. So this is passed in 1787, all right? Uh, and then 1791, the, the first 10 amendments are implemented known as the Bill of Rights. Uh, we'll go over a few of those momentarily. Uh, and just for a little uh, historical uh, information, uh, between uh, 1865 and 1870, we passed three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, 
which are known as the Reconstruction Amendment. So this is after the Civil War. So the 13th Amendment is slavery is not allowed. The 14th Amendment is uh, free individuals are, are given due process, habeas corpus. Um, they have the full rights of citizens. And then the 15th Amendment is all free citizens uh, have the right to vote. Uh, part of the problem with the have the right to vote situation uh, comes up later in the 19th Amendment um, with regard to uh, which would later become uh, women's suffrage, uh, known as women's suffrage, uh, is that we define citizens as free men uh, in, the, in the 14th Amendment. And so women weren't included in the 14th Amendment in that way until we get to the 19th Amendment uh, about 50 years later. In total, there are 27 amendments to the Constitution. Only 26 of them are implemented because one of them was overturned. That was the that was prohibition. With the U.S. Constitution, these are some major things that the U.S. Constitution does that had not been done before. The first thing is the, is the obvious separation of power. So we have three branches of government. First branch of government that we should know about is the legislative branch. This is the branch that makes the laws. This is Congress, and Congress is held in two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. The Senate has two representatives per state. The House of Representatives has a total of 435 members, and this is uh, proportionate to the population. So each member of the House of Representatives uh, represents about 700,000 people in today's population terms. These, again, are the individuals who make the laws. And I'll get to a little bit pet, a little pet peeve of mine here in a second. The executive branch, this is where the president is, is housed, right? So the president is in charge of executing the laws, right? Implementing the laws. So things like the FBI, the Department of Justice, um, all of those uh, uh, um, ICE, Border Control, Customs, uh, all of those uh, entities fall under the president. So the president is charged of just executing the laws as it is written. And then we have the judicial branch. So this is, uh, this says interprets the laws. I'm not sure if I like that word here on this, uh, uh, on this, on this government um, uh, uh, illustration here. The judicial branch is in charge of letting us know whether or not laws are constitutional. Uh, at the highest rank of this is the Supreme Court, but this is the court system that just uh, lets us know who broke the law, whether or not the law falls under the purview of whether or not it's constitutional or not. This is the court system. Now, this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine that goes back, I don't know, since I started actively getting involved in politics on my own as, as, a, as a citizen, as a voter you know, when I was 18. Uh, this is back, you know, George W. Bush, his second term. Uh, when I, I, I stay away from a lot of cable news, but when cable news people come on and start get, getting very, very mad at the president uh, for certain laws that are on the books, no matter who the president is, I always get very upset with that because it is, a, it, it is misinformation with regard to who the citizen should actually be mad at when it comes to who creates the laws. So for, uh, for instance, if you do not like the current immigration laws and you go on the news and rail against Donald Trump, that is an inaccurate place to put your frustrations with immigration laws, right? The role of President Trump is to implement the laws that are currently passed by Congress. Now, if President Trump does not implement the laws faithfully, so if you look at the oath of office for the president, it's like, you know, uphold, you know, the Constitution, execute the laws faithfully, all this other kind of stuff, right? Um, if he doesn't, if he, if he says, I'm not going to follow the laws, that Congress passed, then he's at fault. But uh, if him, President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, go back, go back, right? If you are upset with the current laws, whether it's tax policy, whether it's immigration policy, whether it's healthcare laws, to sit there and put the blame on the president is actually missing the point. If you're upset with how the laws are being implemented, whether or not the laws are being legally followed, sure, get really upset with the president. Um, but anytime people go on and they rail against uh, the laws of the United States, uh, they rail against the president for the laws of the United States, uh, that's very frustrating to me uh, because that's not how the separation of power works. For all intents and purposes, Donald Trump has very little to do with the laws that are passed. We have these veto powers, et cetera. Uh, however, at the end of the day, the legislative branch can overturn vetoes. So get upset with your legislators on the laws. Uh, don't get upset with the president, no matter who the president is. We have a system known as federalism, and what federalism is uh, means is the following. So 
this country is the United States of America, but if we kind of semantically play around with that phrase a little bit, what we're looking at is individual states that are united under a federal government that is currently housed in Washington, D.C. So again, before the Constitution came in, we had the Articles of Confederation, and it was 13 individual states, 13 individual colonies, well, no longer colonies, 13 individual, uh, if we think about it again, like in a model of like the European Union, 13 individual nations, right? They weren't separate nations, but illustration purposes, right? And they came together and they said, we're going to unite just so we have this strong centralized government to help us with things like uh, if we have if we get involved in an international war, uh, we want currency that is all similar to each other. Like we don't want New Jersey to have different currency than Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. If I cross the Ben Franklin Bridge, I don't want to have to change my currency. I don't want to have to show a passport. Right. But Pennsylvania, I'm a citizen of Pennsylvania. Right. And and I'm a citizen of the United States. So I'm a citizen of like two places, Pennsylvania and the United States. Right. But if I want to travel over into New Jersey, New Jersey sort of lets me in with their sovereignty. Right. So New Jersey has sovereignty over its citizens with regard to New Jersey has different laws than Pennsylvania on a whole host of issues. So this is what federalism is, is that individual states, individual uh, localities, municipalities, they're allowed some say with regard to the laws in which their citizens have to operate under. All right. So they're individual. We are individual states first and we're united right, through Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C., under the U.S. Constitution, right, has very limited powers with regard to um, what it is, what the, what, the, what the government can enforce. So if we think about, like, the ratifying of the Constitution, one of the first thing, the, the First Amendment of the Constitution is that the government, the Congress shall make no law uh, prohibiting freedom of speech. Essentially, what the Constitutional Convention was saying was, um, let's take Virginia as an example. Okay, Virginia, you're one of the colonies. If you want to join us under the auspices of a federal government, you know, housed in Washington, D.C., you have to agree to these first 10 amendments that in Virginia, you're not going to prohibit your citizens freedom of speech. You're not going to prohibit uh, you're not going to infringe upon the rights to keep and bear arms. Uh, you're not going to uh, enforce excessive bail. So Virginia, do you agree to follow these you know, first 10 amendments and then eventually 27? And Virginia says, yes. OK, you get to come and sort of be a part of our nation, uh, our, our, our nation. All right. Uh, again, the U.S. Constitution is a document written by the people, uh, but it is written to the government and tells the government what they are and are not allowed to do to me as a citizen. So what type of government does the United States have? Uh, hopefully most of you know this uh, in, in the classroom. Most students will perk up and say things like a democracy. That is inaccurate. All you have to do is say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. I know that this gets a little bit confusing, um, but this is the difference, right? So some people say we live in a republic. Some people say it's a constitutional republic. Some people say it's a democratic republic, which means that we elect our leaders. But at the end of the day, it's a republic. And this is what a republic is compared to a pure democracy. A republic protects the rights of the individual first and foremost, above the rights of whatever people might vote for. So when people say things like we are a, uh, a democratic republic, what they mean is that democratically we vote our leaders into office, right? We vote for our senators, our House of Representatives, our presidents, our mayors, our governors. We vote for them, but their primary duty is to protect individual rights. So I, as an individual, have rights that cannot be superseded just because people uh, take a vote. So let's look at what this is, right? Um, even if the majority vote to enslave an individual, that individual has rights. So if we give a, give a couple examples throughout U.S. history here, right? During the time of slavery, right, especially around the Civil War, especially halfway through the Civil War specifically, most people were willing to vote that it is okay for the South to have slaves if we end the Civil War. And this goes back to 1863 when uh, President Lincoln gives his Gettysburg Address because during the Gettys during after the Battle of Gettysburg, a lot of people in the North wanted to say, you know what? Forget this civil war. Let the South keep their slaves. I vote that they can. I, I'm per, I personally, I'm, a, I'm in the North. I don't want to have slaves, but if other people want to vote to have slaves, fine. Most people would have been okay with slavery if we would have taken a vote. But Abraham Lincoln and the platform of the Republican Party in 1860 said, no, 
these individuals have rights. You cannot take away somebody's individual right to freedom, to keep the fruits of their labor, no matter what people vote for. When we get through the era of women's suffrage, right, and the passage of the 19th Amendment in uh, 1920, there were even a lot of women who did not want the right to vote. You know, there were women out there who said, you know what, let my husband take care of it. I don't want to get involved in politics. So if you would have taken a vote, there would have been a lot of people who said, nope, don't let women vote. But again, individual women have the right to vote regardless of whether or not the majority um, says yes or no to women having the right to vote. And the finally, the last example, which I think is extremely interesting, is the issue of same-sex marriage. Prior to the Supreme Court stepping in uh, on the issue of same-sex marriage, there were 31 states that voted against allowing same-sex couples to get married, including California, right? Which I think is absolutely fascinating. Even California, the most, possibly the most pro-gay-friendly place, uh, in, uh, possibly in America, definitely, you know, possibly in the world, right? Even voted against allowing same-sex couples to marry as late as 2008. A few years later, the Supreme Court steps in and says, look, we do not care if a democracy, the majority rules, you know, gay people cannot marry. We do not care that a majority vote was taken. We live in a republic and a republic says these individuals have the right to get married regardless of what the majority says. So here's a little cartoon that's often sort of pulled up when people talk about sort of the faults of democracy, right? Democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner, all right? Hopefully you get that fun little joke, right? And obviously at the end of the day, this poor little sheep has individual rights not to get eaten, regardless of whether or not he's outvoted two to one, all right? So that's the difference between a republic and a democracy. You live in a republic, you wanna live in a republic. If you live in a democracy, then the majority can take away your rights uh, because then you have majority rules and you do not want majority to rule. We can also look at this with regard to liberty and democracy. What liberty means, is that you as a sovereign individual have the right to do what it is you want with your life, right? You have sovereignty, you have freedom, right? That's what liberty means. Everyone says they want liberty. Not many people understand the definition of it, but the long and short of it is as long as you don't hurt other people, right? You should be able to do whatever it is that you want with your life. Individual is primary. The individual is first. You're in charge of your life. And what is sometimes phrased as the tyranny of the majority cannot take that away from you. So the tyranny of the majority would be, you know, hey, we all voted to take away, you know, Professor Phillips's, you know, right to whatever. Um, the tyranny cannot vote to, uh, to take away my individual rights. This is where I get a little bit frustrated with things like uh, cable news polls, right, especially after very emotional events where they say things like, hey, you know, there was an emotional very hard event that just happened in the world and now we're going to take a poll and 80 percent of americans agree that we should x y and z we should make uh, hate speech illegal we should uh take away people's uh rights to keep and bear arms the problem with this is that these polls are going to go up and down and if at any point the public votes to take away your civil liberties right your 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 um, the amendments guaranteed to you by the by the u.s constitution that's a problem, right? What the US Constitution says is that your rights do not change. Public opinion is gonna change. One day the public's gonna say, we want more gun control. Uh, the next day the public's gonna say, we want less gun control. We can see some of this up and down movement. Here's some of the up and down movement uh, in a little chart about the, the red says these people uh, are in favor. This isn't, the red, it's not Republican and Democrat, but it's just sort of in favor and um, oppose gun regulations. You can see how sort of, People have kind of gone up and down with whether or not they want stricter gun control, right? Um, usually after a mass shooting, um, un unfortunate situations, a lot of people are like, we want more gun control. Uh, during these protests right now where, you know, cops aren't responding as quick, there's a lot of people going out there and say, we want, you know, we want to have access to, to firearms in order to protect ourselves, our neighborhoods and our communities, right? So the polling on guns goes up and down. So that's why democracy is a bad way to uh, figure out difficult ideas is because public polling is going to go up and down. People's opinions are going to change, right? So public opinions change, your rights do not. The same thing is true over here with issues of hate speech. Um, and this is where we're going to sort of slide into with regard to the First Amendment and free speech here momentarily.
But people's opinions change on hate speech, whether or not hate speech should or shouldn't be illegal. Again, the problem with this is that if the majority chooses that I can't use certain words or I'm not allowed to um, espouse certain uh, um, political ideas, that's going to be a problem for me, right? If I'm in the minority, right? And this is what John Stuart Mill talks about, you know, the minority of one, right? The minor, even if you are in the minority, if you're the only person who wants to say that thing, you should be allowed to say that thing, right? Even if everybody else opposes you. Um, some other problems with hate speech is that, you know, it, it's difficult to define, right? Who gets to define what hate speech is or not, uh, especially if you look at things, uh, you know, like uh, comedy or art. Um, if I say, you know, if I'm just regular guy on the street and I say something hateful, you might be able to say, yeah, Josh said something hateful, make him so he can't stop it. There can be a comedian or a movie or some sort of piece of art that says the exact same thing that I do. But now we started getting into like, okay, what's the intent? What's the context? Now you start playing mind games with people. And all of a sudden you have to decide, you know, who can say what in what circumstances. Um, and that becomes a big legal problem with certain trying to slice and dice with regard to who can say what. Uh, but again, people's opinions on hate speech go up and down. Uh, but that's why the First Amendment says that you are guaranteed the right to, to speak freely without being sanctioned by the government. And I'll make that distinction here momentarily. In the United States, we need to know the difference between positive and negative rights. The U.S. Constitution, again, it's a document written to the government. It's written by the people, right? Prior to the U.S., most constitutions or legal documents that sort of operated um, or uh, that sort of created countries and, and nation states and what have you, most of them were written to the people <clears throat> and they told the people what they could and could not do. So the king would put out some sort of manifesto that says, you know what? I just came into power. Um, I'm the new king. You know, my dad died, so I get to take over. I'm going to write you a manifesto of what I, you can you can do and you can't do now. Obviously, this is a problem uh, because it, it, it's based on the, the, the whims of the government that day. It's based on the whims of the king that day. The U.S. Constitution was written by the people to the government. So this is one thing. And if anybody knows anybody out there in the cable news world, please send them this because this is one thing that drives me up the wall when I see a panel on, I don't know, CNN or whatever. When people start saying things like the following, and this is crossed out for a reason. When people say things like, the Constitution gives me the freedom to speak, that is inaccurate. And I know it's a bit of a rhetorical semantic game, but it's extremely important to understand in U.S. law uh, and, and the United States government. The Constitution does not give you the right to do anything, all right? What is more accurate is the following. The Constitution tells the government that they cannot infringe upon my right to speak. So when the, when the Constitution was written, it already assumed that because I'm a born human being, I have all these rights. The Constitution doesn't give you rights, right? And I'm gonna show you specific language in the Constitution to, to sort of prove this point here momentarily. Right. But when people get on the news and say, you know, I have the right to speak freely because the Constitution gives me the right to speak freely. That is an inaccurate statement. It'd be more accurate to say, look, I have the right to speak freely because the Constitution guarantees that the government cannot infringe upon my right to speak freely. And I have that right because I'm a born free human being. I know it's not as pithy. All right. But that is more accurate, precise language with regard to the mindset of how the Constitution was written. It was written with the idea that you are born free and the government cannot infringe upon your freedoms. And that is very, very different than coming in and saying, government, give me rights. Government, tell me what I can and can't do. You don't want to live in that world because then you're just sitting there begging the government for your rights the whole time. Let's look a little bit deeper into this issue. So again, negative rights means that governments, kings, and tyrants don't give you the right to do anything. You already have them. Right. You have the right to speak freely. You have the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, you have the right um, uh, habeas corpus. Uh, you know, you have the you have lots of rights. Right. Look through the 27 amendments. Government doesn't give them to you. In contrast, I'll come to this section in a second. But in contrast, positive rights, which you do not want, you do not want to live in a world with positive rights, would be I, the government, wrote the Constitution and I'm going to give you the right to speak. And if you live in a country that does that, Therefore, the government at any time could take it away. So if the government is in charge of writing your constitution, 
then you just have to sit there and like cross your fingers and hope like, oh, I hope the government doesn't write a different constitution tomorrow. You want the power in your hands, right? So again, our constitution, the US constitution starts off with, we the people are writing a letter. Ooh, that's, that feels, that's, that's very powerful. Like I am writing a letter to my government telling my government what it can and can't do. That gives me the power. That gives me the people the power, right? If the government writes your constitution, then the government can take it away. So if I positively, if I'm the king, I can positively give you a right today, I can take it away tomorrow. Negative rights say that I'm already born with them and the government cannot infringe upon them. It tells the government what it cannot negatively, what it cannot do. All right, so this gets a little bit political. This is not meant to be political. It's simply here to make a, a legal point and, and tell you why it's difficult to do some of these things. If you wanna go out there and advocate for these things in the 2020 election or for the rest of your life, 100% fine with that, but let's just talk about the, 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 the semantics here, right? So under a negative rights system, it's hard to argue that things like healthcare or, or things like education, um, housing, et cetera, it's hard to argue that these things are rights because these are positive rights that other people have to give you. For instance, if you wanna say healthcare is a human right, well, then you have to have a doctor involved in, in giving you the healthcare. If you wanna say education's a right, you have to, then, then teachers have to be involved in giving to you, right? Negative rights, which is what the United States is, uh, system is, right? You can do whatever it is you want and you don't have to have other people involved, right? I have the right to speak, but I can't demand that, a, that CNN puts me on the air, right? Um, I have the right to protect myself, but I can't demand that the government purchase a firearm for me, right? So I have these rights, but other people aren't involved with them. I'm allowed to go out there and pursue those rights on my own, right? So again, we play a little semantic game here, right? With uh, issue of healthcare. You could say, look, you have the right to go and pursue whatever healthcare you want. You have the right to go out and pursue whatever education you want, but you can't demand that other people step in and, and give those things to you, right? You have the right to speak, but you can't demand that somebody gives you the microphone, right? You can go make your own microphone, right? Uh, you have the right to, to have a firearm, but you can't demand that someone purchases that firearm for you, right? So things like healthcare, when people say things like healthcare or education are a right, uh, technically speaking, they aren't rights. What they are is that, that those things fall under things like contract law or entitlements. Um, so you can make a contract with a doctor and say, hey doctor, like I'm gonna pursue you to help me with my ailments and then you, me and the doctor write up a contract and now the, now the, the contract, Right now, now I'm entitled to healthcare from the doctor because we both signed a contract that says, you know, this doctor is going to give me healthcare. You and I, as teacher student, right? Uh, if we cut out the middleman of Penn State for a moment, but essentially what the, what you and I are engaged in is some sort of contract law where you signed up with Penn State and said, I'm going to give Penn State X amount of money. Penn State hired me and said, okay, Josh, you signed a contract that says you're going to teach these students. Now you and I are engaged in the contract law. Right? It's not a right that you have to educate. If you had a right to education, you could come to my door, right? knock on the door and say, professor, I have a right to education. You have to, you have to teach me. No, 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 no. I signed a contract with Penn State that said I would teach you. You signed a contract with Penn State that said you give them X amount of money in order to learn from me. And so now you and I are engaged in the contract, right? But it's not a right. A right would mean that there is no sort of negotiation between us. So here's a couple amendments from the US Constitution. And this sort of proves the fact that the U.S. Constitution is written by the people for the government, and it's set up as, as, a, as a place for negative rights. So if we looked at the First Amendment, we go back to where I had that cross out um, of when people say things, when people on cable news or CNN panel say things like, the Constitution gives you the right to speak freely. Not true. If you read the First Amendment, all right, the First Amendment says Congress, right? Congress is a stand-in for the government. So this is the big G word, right? For the rest of these, uh, for all four of these amendments I have listed here. Congress, so the government, dear government, dear Congress, you shall not make a law, right? In contrast, if it was a positive right, it would say, the First Amendment says, the citizens of the United States have the right to speak freely. That's not how this is written. And this is a very important distinction in world history, all right? The First Amendment says Congress, Dear United States government, Congress, you shall not make a law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting free exercise thereof, abridging the freedom of speech or the press, the right of the people to peacefully assemble, uh, petition the government for redress of grievances. The First Amendment assumes that I as a citizen 
have the right to practice religion freely, uh, have the right to speak freely, have the right to peacefully assemble, to protest my government for redresses, etc. The Constitution assumes that and says, government, you can't make a law prohibiting me from doing that. And I have those rights because I'm a born free human being. Right? This is a human civil right. The Second Amendment, right? the rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Again, this does not say the government gives you, the citizen, the right to go out and purchase a gun. No, it doesn't. Because if it gave you the right, it could also take away the right. Instead, the Second Amendment says, look, I'm a born free person. I'm allowed to defend myself. I can keep and bear arms, right? Security of a free state, et cetera, right? You, the government, cannot infringe upon my right to, uh, for, 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 for me to act in, in, in ways that are, you know, would be considered self-defense. The Third Amendment, no soldier, right? And again, the soldier here, representative of the government, the government, no soldier. The government cannot, in a time of peace, be quartered in my house without consent of the owner. The government can't just come into my house and set up shop and say, hey, we're going to live here now. All right. And finally, the, we'll go jump down to the Eighth Amendment. You can check out all these amendments, right? Excessive bail, which is the court system. Again, the court system, the judiciary. This is a representative of the government. Dear government, right? Excessive bail shall not be required, right? Or excessive fines, cruel and unusual punishment inflicted, et cetera, right? So again, these amendments to the Constitution, they're all addressed to the government. The Constitution does not tell me anything because I, though I am, we the people, we are the ones writing the Constitution and saying, government, this is what you can and cannot do to us, all right? These are, our, these are negative rights. We are born with these rights to speak, to practice religion, to keep and bear arms, to... Um, to, to, to have, you know, fair and just trials. Like we are born with these rights to be treated fairly. You can't infringe upon those rights. So let's look a little bit deeper at the First Amendment. Uh, this painting over here is by Norman Wa uh, Rockwell. Um, it's, it's a First Amendment painting. Um, you can look it up, rather famous. Uh, but what it's supposed to depict is uh, a, a citizen, just an average citizen at a, a city council meeting, um, sort of being the minority of one who just says like, hey, I disagree with everybody, but I'm allowed to stand up and, and, and speak freely about this particular issue in my city council. All right, fantastic. And we're gonna make a distinction here between public and private speech. So when we talk about the First Amendment, a staple of a democracy, right, and again, we made the distinction between democracy and republic, but democracy is sort of like, let's all argue about these things. We all have equal access to the platform and then we're gonna vote for our leaders. But the role of the leaders is to implement a republic form of government that protects individual rights first and foremost. All right, but we elect those leaders to do those things for us. So a staple of that is being able to speak one's belief even if it is unpopular, all right? So uh, for my students, I will send you out this link. For everyone else, you can search this on YouTube. Um, it's from uh, FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. It's a YouTube clip of theirs. Um, and the clip is called, if you want to uh, type this into YouTube, Fencing and Free Speech in Los Angeles, uh, Pierce uh, College. And it's about ways in which uh, Pierce College has sort of made um, uh, unconstitutional laws uh, regarding student speech. So with regard to an open and free society, you have to have you have to allow people to speak freely. And let's first and foremost talk about the government uh, role in this. So after you watch this clip, we can you can come back and check this stuff out, right? So you as an individual have the right to speak, and you do not need permission from the government. This is a big staple of uh, the sort of open, free uh, society where we democratically elect our leaders. You can speak freely and you do not need permission from the government to do so, all right? There's a small little exception that they talk about in this YouTube clip where we talk about things like value neutral. So let's look at a college campus. If I'm in a classroom, when I, when I get back to the classroom, right, after this COVID situation, the, the, I, and, I, and I teach at a public school, so this, should, this is important, right? I'm allowed to implement policies that say, for example, Students who are not enrolled in my classroom cannot barge into my classroom holding protest signs that say vote for Biden or vote for Trump, right? Now, this is important because it's value neutral. No one is allowed to come into my classroom and campaign for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump in the upcoming election, right? If as long as I say I'm, I'm not, I'm, what I'm not saying is, hey, if you barge into my classroom, you cannot be holding a Trump sign. 
But if you barge into my classroom and hold a Joe Biden sign, I'll let you come in here and you can say whatever you want. That would not be value neutral, right? As a teacher, right, I represent the government in this instance, right, because I teach at a public school. So I have to make sure that I have value neutral terms when it comes to how my students are and are not allowed to speak. The same thing can be true on college campuses when it comes to um, speakers or protest. If, if, there, if there's an open quad area, everybody with whatever idea should be allowed to be in that quad with flyers, with handouts saying, you know, vote for Democrats, vote for Republicans, um, you know, Planned Parenthood, hurrah, um, you know, get rid of abortion, you know, kind of stuff. Like everyone should be allowed in that quad and we can't regulate the content um, of that quad. What the school could do is say, look, you're allowed to engage in political speech, but you can't block the doorways. All right. So just sort of like stay, you know, 10 feet away from the door, 20 feet away from the door. So people can, you can't prohibit people from entering certain classrooms or certain buildings, right? You can't just stand in the middle of the sidewalk and block traffic. All right. This gets into some of the legal issues around some of the protests currently going on and protests that have been going on in this country for hundreds of years when it comes to things like uh, blocking streets. Right. You are allowed to protest, but there are rules that say, look, you got to get a you got to get a permit um, if you want to shut down a street. Right. So the government can't come in and say they, they can't tell you what you can and can't protest or what you can and can't say. But they can say, look, there's like certain sort of movement things that we need to allow um, with regard to uh, the content. So I'll give you a quick example of this. Uh, and this is a this is one that that that's recent in the news. So Redwood City is a suburb of San Francisco, and we saw this with some of the Black Lives Matter protests, where a lot of Black Lives Matter protests were painting these um, murals all over the streets, and in a bit of a trolley way, but to definitely prove this value neutral point, is there was an organization um, or some citizens in Redwood City, again suburb of San Francisco, that said, hey, you know what, you are allowing. Um, Black Lives Matter protesters to go out there and paint these big murals on the street that say Black Lives Matter on the street. Um, okay, then we're going to paint a big MAGA 2020 message on the street. And Redwood City actually ended up caving and said, okay, we're not going to we're not going to do this Black Lives Matter protest thing on the street anymore because they knew that they couldn't institute some sort of value neutral. Um, they, they, they weren't they they wouldn't be able to uphold the value neutral idea because you're using a public street. If it's a private street, people can do what they want. But if you take a city street and you write a, a message on there that is uh, of a political persuasion, that means you have to allow everybody to come in and write a message on your streets of political persuasions, right? Because you have to be value neutral. I, the government, can't tell you you can write this political message, but you can't write another one. I, the government, can say, look, this is a public street. We're not, nobody's going to write on it. Or I can say, look, these are public streets. Have at it. You all can write all over them all you want, but I can't. I'm not allowed to control the message as as an arbiter of the governor uh, of the government. So let's get talk a little bit about public schools here in the classroom, which a public school or make a distinction, right? You do not need my permission as your teacher, right? Nor should I be allowed to censor you when it comes to speaking, right? You don't need to raise you don't need to raise your hand and say, am I allowed to you know make this comment, right? Um, no, you're allowed to make whatever comment you want, right? And I can't censor you and I can't punish you for your speech, right? So this is the big item with the government. The government cannot come in and sanction you for your speech. That's really what it comes down to. So this does create legal problems. And again, I know that this is like hot button issue kind of stuff, but I'm just talking the legality of it. This does create legal problems with things when people say things like, you know, hate speech regulations, uh, bias reporting safe spaces, and not allowing some speakers on college campuses. Because if you're talking about a public school, as soon as the public school says political speech is allowed, then they have to be value neutral in allowing anyone to speak on certain political issues. All right, you can't say this, this sort of political speech is allowed and this kind of speech isn't allowed. You have to implement it through a value neutral lens. So let's look at how this is different. Uh, let's look at how this is different from a private organization. Private organizations can censor your speech and private organizations often do censor your speech. So the easy one for all of us to understand is something over here with regard to work uniforms. Your employer, when you go out and get a job, your employer can say, look, at this company, we have a dress code and you have to wear a certain attire uh, otherwise, we're going to ask you to leave or, or maybe we're going to fire you. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. 
Uh, but if they say, look, um, we're kind of here in the 53%, you know, sort of like relaxed business casual. We're a business casual type of place. You know, guys maybe, you know, wear a collar shirt or what have you. Um, you don't wear a shirt that has like Bud Light logos on it, right? Um, don't wear that kind of shirt or we're going to ask you to leave. Or we're going to dock your pay. So private companies do this. And if you violate those rules of a private company, again, this is contract. I sign a contract and say, dear company, I will follow your dress code rules. And if I sign the contract and start taking those paychecks, as soon as I violate those dress code rules, the company is allowed to say, you're out of here. You violated, which essentially is some sort of expression, right? You violated the codes of expression. You decide to express yourself in a way that we do not agree with with regard to um, dress code, all right? If, let's look at schools real quick. If we were at the University of Notre Dame, which is a private Catholic school, right? and I don't think this is a policy at University of Notre Dame, most private schools don't, but private schools are allowed a lot of latitude because they're private schools. If we're at a private school and I said, okay, everyone, uh, before class begins, you know, you come into my college classroom, before class begins, everyone needs to stand and we're all gonna say the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you don't stand, I'm gonna punish you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dock your grade by 10 points. I can't, I, I'm allowed to do that at a private school. At Penn State, public institution, I cannot do that because that's what we call compelled speech, right? I, the government, cannot compel you to speak through the threat of sanctions, all right? Um, if we go to a Catholic school, right, I could say, look, there's a private Catholic school. Before class every day, we're all going to fold our hands, we're going to bow our heads, and we're going to say a prayer. And if you don't, I'm going to dock you points. That's allowed, right, because it's a private school. Again, at Penn State, I'm not allowed to do that because the government cannot compel speech from you, right? The government can't censor you. Uh, the government's not allowed to sanction you. So this is a little idiom that a lot of people throw around. They say things like freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom, uh, freedom from consequences. And the correct response to that is yes and no. Freedom of speech does mean that you are free from government consequences, right? I speak freely. The government cannot come in and sanction me for that speech. So I am free of consequences, right? The government can't find me. The government can't put me in jail, right? Uh, because I'm a teacher, right? If my student says something I disagree with, I'm not allowed to punish my student because I'm a representative of the government sort of in a public school type of setting, right? However, Freedom of speech does mean that you might receive some consequences through stigma, right? So freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of consequences. It's like, sure, if, if, I post, if I post something on Facebook that is awful and disgusting, I might lose all my Facebook friends. People might start spreading rumors about me and say, you know, don't hang out with Josh because he's an awful person who posts things on Facebook. So there are these sort of social stigma consequences that come with it, right? If I work at a private school, I could get fired from my job at a private school. If I wear clothes that are not up to dress code, I could get fired. So there, are, there could be consequences if we're talking about sort of private affair consequences, right? I lose friends. I lose my job if my job is in a private institution, right? So freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of consequences because I could lose those things. Freedom of speech does mean I should be free from government consequences. The government should never come in and find me or put me in jail for things that I say, all right? And this extends to things like, again, public school in the classroom. I should not dock your grade because you say something that I disagree with, right? Because in this situation, I'm the representative of the government, you are a student, right? And you have those rights protected by the Constitution. Uh, another quick example would be something like the NFL. Uh, so this is one thing that bugged me a lot because uh, I'm a big dork when it comes to the First Amendment. Uh, when NFL players a couple years ago were kneeling it didn't bug me that they were kneeling. They can kneel all they want, you know, definitely support that, right? What I did not agree with is when uh, they would go up to the microphone after the games and say things like, the NFL is trying to um, suppress my freedom of speech. Whole lot of wrong legal uh, words in there. The NFL cannot suppress your First Amendment rights because the NFL is not the government, all right? The NFL is not the government. So... This is how you could have your First Amendment rights squashed if you were an NFL player kneeling. If you took a knee, right, like Colin Kaepernick's doing right here, if you took a knee and then a police officer came out on the field and arrested you, now your First Amendment rights are being violated because the government is sanctioning you for, free, for, 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 for speaking in certain ways. That is totally unacceptable, not allowed. But the NFL is a private organization. And if you sign an, a contract with the NFL that says, you know what, I'm going to stand for the anthem, right? If you sign a contract with a certain uh, Catholic school that says, I'm going to pray at school, 
and you don't do those things, then those organizations can come in and fire you. They can tell you you can't play. They can tell you you're going to get kicked out of school. Your boss can say you can't work here anymore if you wear certain clothes, right? So this is the big difference. And here's the thing is the NFL does this all the time. The problem the NFL ran into is the NFL actually had no language in its contracts about what players were supposed to do during the national anthem, which is very different than the NBA. There's a lot of kind of satirical poking fun at uh, NBA players during the when when the kneeling started because a lot of NBA players were like we are with Colin Kaepernick and the kneeling but if you go back and look all the NBA players were standing you know why all the NBA players were standing because in the NBA contract it says stand for the national anthem or we're going to fine you right we're going to put you on some sort of sus uh, suspension so all these NBA players talked a big game and said we are with Colin Kaepernick kneel for the anthem but when it came to them actually kneeling None of them kneeled because they're like, oh, we have something in our contract that says if we kneel during the national anthem, we're going to get fined. Now, the NBA's changed their position since. So now if you watch the NBA, the NBA playoffs are on. There's lots of players kneeling during the national anthem because during the summer, what else is going on? They changed the contract, right? So now it's allowed that players kneel during the national anthem. The NFL ran into trouble because there was just no policy on the on, on, on standing or sitting or kneeling during the national anthem. All right. Um, the N I mean, the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, everybody, I mean, they have rules about what cleats you can wear. So this was, this was a controversial case, like when players wear certain cleats or they wear certain jewelry, right? Or they wear certain, um, you know, it's, it's like if you're sponsored by Nike, Nike makes you sign a contract that says you're only going to wear Nike. You're not going to wear Reebok. And if you're a professional athlete and you show up in a Reebok shirt, you're going to get fined by, by Nike. Nike's going to come in and say, hey, you broke our contract. So people's speech is suppressed all the time, but it's willingly suppressed because they enter into contracts with people that say, I'm going to speak in certain ways. The only time the First Amendment is um, it, uh, becomes an issue is if the government steps in and tries to sanction you. So when everyone's going around talking about freedom of speech in the NFL or the NBA or kneeling or what uniforms you can wear and all this other kind of stuff, that has nothing to do with the First Amendment. Absolutely zero. The only time it has anything to do with the First Amendment, again, is if Colin Kaepernick takes a knee and a cop comes out on the field and arrests him. Now we have a problem, right? But if Roger Goodell's like, hey, Colin Kaepernick, you're fired. Uh, if Colin Kaepernick would have signed a contract that says, I'm going to stand, and people say, like, I don't want to deal with you. Like, I don't want to be around you because you spoke in a certain way. That, that unfor like that doesn't fall under the, under the auspices of First Amendment. First Amendment only applies if the government steps in and sanctions. All right. Other than that, it's all about contracts and what you signed. And if you sign certain contracts that says you'll do X, Y, and Z, then you have to abide by X, Y, and Z. Finally, all right, what we have here is uh, what type of speech does the First Amendment protect? And this is something that you just, you don't, it's, it's a good illustration, but if you think about it for longer than a couple seconds, you realize like, okay, this makes sense. So we have a couple of competing signs here. The first says that free speech is hate speech. The other one says that hate speech is not free speech. And you say, well, which one's correct? Well, the answer is, well, no, free speech can include like awful, disgusting things, right? Like things I don't want other people to say. Now, this is the difference, right? When people go around and say, look, I support free speech. I can also say, look, I, I think people should be very polite and kind to each other. And people shouldn't say disgusting, awful, horrible things, right? But that's different than saying like, you know, people shouldn't be allowed to say those things, right? In some ways, I actually want people to say exactly what's on their mind because I want to know what people I should avoid, right? I want my friends, I want my politicians to say exactly what they're thinking because I don't want them to hide it because I want to know who I'm hanging out with. So let's look at these two examples real quick, all right? And then we're done, all right? If free speech... Right. If the First Amendment doesn't protect things like hate speech, offensive speech, unpopular speech, political speech, controversial speech, right, then there's no reason to have it at all. If we all go around the world saying like, look, I love rainbows and puppy dogs and a nice fall breeze and, you know, pumpkin spice lattes. Right. You don't need to protect that speech. The only reason it makes sense for a First Amendment to have to exist is because the founders knew Madison knew when he wrote the Constitution. Man, people are going to say some stuff that's real messed up. People are going to say things that are unpopular and controversial and political, and we need to make sure that that's protected. You don't need a First Amendment for things that you already agree with, right? Um, so if you're a person who's like, I support free speech, then think of like what it is your political opposition would say. And if you don't want them to say it, um, 
excuse me, if you think that they shouldn't be allowed to say it, then you actually don't support free speech. If I say I support free speech, but I only support the speech that I already agree with that's not controversial or, you know, uh, a uh, that, 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 that is a uh, politically convenient, you know, speech that's popular with, I don't support free speech. I just support people who like me, which is what everybody does, right? Everybody supports people who like them. Everybody supports people who agree with them politically, right? To test whether or not you are truly a free speech advocate, you should go out and try and, and you should go out and advocate on behalf of those individuals who are saying things that you do not like, saying things that are controversial. You don't, don't advocate for what they're saying, advocate for their right to say it, all right? Because again, if we were all just agreeing with each other, there's no reason to have a First Amendment. We have a First Amendment because the founders knew, hey, people are gonna say things offensive. And that's what free speech protects. Free speech does not protect conversations about puppies and rainbows and unicorns, right? Everybody loves those things, all right? And then the last item here, well, uh, let's talk real quick about this George Orwell quote where he says, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear, right? And then the last thing is just sort of a, a, just like an implementation thing, right? And this is one thing that really, really worries me when people go around and say things like, we need to institute laws that curb speech. I personally do not want 535, 537, if you include the vice president and the president involved in these conversations. So there's 535 members of Congress. Right. And then add the president, vice president, you got 537. I do not want a handful of people in Washington, D.C. telling 330 Americans what they can and cannot say. Right. So the question becomes, like, do you want 330 million Americans debating what speech we should and shouldn't have, what words we shouldn't and shouldn't use, what words should be sort of taken out of polite society? Right. Do you want all those? Do you want 330 million people or do you just want like a handful of of politicians and bureaucrats sort of telling us all what we can and can't say, all right? I would rather have 330 million of us debating these things, right? I would have, I would rather have 330 million of us um, get on Facebook and say, whoa, Josh made a really gross Facebook post. Like, let's like, let's not talk to Josh anymore. I would rather have that than have the government come in and start like taking your Facebook post down, all right? Have that open debate. Because once you give power to, to a handful of people to control speech, you never know when they're going to come for speech that you actually agree with. As soon as you give people a little people in power a little bit of, of leeway, after you give them a little bit of leeway, all of a sudden they're going to say, ooh, I have the next thing that I want to censor. I have the next speech I want to regulate. And eventually it's going to be stuff that you like. So if you start giving people a reason to um, take certain books out of the library, eventually they're going to take a book that you like. If you tell people there's certain words you can and can't use in movies, eventually they're gonna start censoring some of your favorite movies, right? And the same thing is true if we get it out of the United States government in Washington, D.C. and put it down on a government level of, of, of Penn State University, right? Which again, it's a public school, so it, it falls under the auspices of, 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 government, uh, of, of what government can and can't do with regard to speech, right? Do you want everyone at Penn State, all the students opening up for debate, or do you want like a small group of like 10 people on some sort of committee board telling you what you can and can't say in your classroom, what speech you can give in a public speaking class? Uh, if you're a professor, what books you can and can't have on your syllabus? That hits me the wrong way. I don't want 10 people on a committee, right, at the top levels of some bureaucracy telling the rest of us, all of us, what we can and can't say, what we can and can't do, what we can and can't read, what we can and can't have in our classrooms. And that's what the choice is, all right? Uh, one thing, and I'll, and I'll leave you with this, one thing that I tell individuals is that there's only two ways that human beings throughout the course of human history have solved problems. One is through violence. If you and I have a disagreement, we can, we've only saw, figured out to solve it two ways. One is through violence, right? We have some sort of force, which could include government sanctions like fining me $500, right, for saying the wrong word, right, that's force, that's violence, right, or through open debate. Those are the only two ways we've decided. And if you, and if you tell people you can no longer openly debate, you can no longer speak freely about certain issues, then people are going to resort back to the violence. And I would rather people say things that are nasty than someone punch me in the face. So the only two ways we solve things is through violent conflict and through free and open debates. And if you get rid of free and open debates, people are going to resort back to violent conflicts. All right. So that's our discussion on the Constitution, uh, free speech and the First Amendment. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see how this goes after I post it on YouTube. It's my first one on YouTube. And uh, if it goes well, maybe I'll post some 
some more lectures up here on YouTube. All right, see you all later.